All right, welcome back to Between Two Buffs. I'm Major Campbell, I'm a clinical psychologist and the Installation Director of Psychological Health. Uh, can you guys introduce yourselves today? So I'm Tech Sergeant Bethia. I'm a second OSS. Awesome. I'm Senior Airman Colley from the 11th Bomb Squadron. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about stress, uh, the stressors that military members experience. Uh, both in our personal lives as well as the unique stressors that we have as being military uh, members. And then also just the world around us, the things that are going on and how that adds to uh, what we've experienced and how we manage that. Uh, so right now, right, you'd have to be living under a rock to not see that we have a lot of things going on. Uh, in the past, I'd say 18 months, both uh, in the United States, uh, around the world, uh, specifically in the military environment, um, pandemics, there's so much going on. Uh, and, and then you look at each individual person too, right? We, we may have families, we may have friends, we may have loved ones, we may have a car payment, we may have all kinds of things <laughs> going on uh, that, uh, that wears at us and, and uh, uh, breaks us down. So when you think about your current stressors and the things that you've got going on, um, where do you, where, where do your mind go with that? What kinds of things are, are staying with you guys? What kinds of things are on your mind? As far as what kind of things are stressing us? Or... Yeah, what, what are kind of your everyday stressors? Uh, well, for me, I think one of my everyday stressors is always going to be my family, make sure my family is taken care of, and then also my military family, uh, my airmen. I'm always worried about um, what's going on in their personal life because, you know, as a military member, it's, it's kind of hard in the leadership position you you have to be personal with them, but you don't want to get all in their personal business at the same time. So it's always a, a stressor to make sure that they're doing good and they're, they're being taken care of. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. I had a airman yesterday that said uh, he got home from work and there was a shooting in his apartment complex. And so you kind of look at that situation and you go, hey, this is somebody that just got off of a long day of work and now they got to go home to a what they think is a safe environment and, and yes. manage new stressors too. So mm -hmm. yeah, great point. Okay. Um, probably some stressors for me. Uh, I'm in a office currently with, where it's just me running the CSS for an entire squadron. So dealing with that kind of puts some pressure on me. Yeah. And recently just moving into a new house, you know, all the finances and everything can definitely take a toll on your stress. Yeah, and, so. <laughs> and military, right? We're constantly moving, yeah. constantly. Mm -hmm. I told somebody that my um, my coping strategy is collecting moving boxes, which yes. is really dysfunctional. <laughs> but I have a, an Excel spreadsheet where I know how many moving boxes will it will take to pack up my house, and that keeps me calm. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's a it's a real part of life, right? The constant mm -hmm. transition. Yes. So when you think about the, how long have each, each of you guys been in? I've been in for 20 years. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So a long time. I just hit my three year mark. <laughs> okay. So kind of a, a wide spectrum there. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the, um, your time in the military, whether it's, it's a few years or, or much longer, several decades, um, where do you, when you think about your, you've joined this organization where you're uh, part of something bigger than yourself, where do you find your sense of purpose? Where, where do you put yourself in all of that? Mm. For me, my sense of purpose. Um, for me, it's honestly, I would have to go back um, for me being spiritual. Um, you have to find your own sense of purpose and find like your moral code and what's, what drives you to do what you do. Yeah. So. Um, I would probably be just like the like feeling like I'm accomplishing a lot in my like work life. Um, I mean, it feels pretty good when I get to like fix an issue for people. So like that gives me purpose being in the office because sometimes I feel as though I'm not doing much, but the officers come in all the time and they're like, you're doing great. You're doing everything right. Like you're helping us a lot. So like that feels really good to so me. Get that sense of productivity and mm -hmm. getting accomplished. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so kind of different different perspectives on that sense of purpose, right? So both the spiritual side as well as kind of feeling like you're contributing to the overall mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when uh, when you think about what's um, what's going on, big picture, right? Both in your personal life and and uh, throughout the world, um, 
do you do you ever find yourself struggling with your sense of purpose? Um, I know that's kind of personal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a clinical psychologist by nature. I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes I just get in my head and start thinking, and I'm like, "Why am I doing this? Like, what? What's the reasoning for this? Like, um." I've had some like I had some financial financial issues for a little while and it just kind of financial financial fi- oh my gosh I can't talk financial issues really get to you and they bring you down a lot so in my head I'm like I'm working at this job but I still have all these issues personally like what what's happening why am I doing this um so yeah I've had some issues where I'm like what what's the purpose of all this kind of thing they're trying to find the connection. Yeah. To, yeah. Uh, I feel the same way. Um, I think it's natural that you're going to struggle with purpose sometimes. Um, just like the seasons change, I think your purpose actually changed too. Um, a lot of times as you grow and develop through the military too. Um, but I think there's always like a, a baseline purpose and stuff like that. So, yeah, I definitely struggled through finances also too, young airmen and stuff and growing up in the military. And then I think a lot of people will struggle with um, – just the whole military lifestyle is different from being a civilian. Um, you have to adapt a new family very quickly. So yeah, there's definitely different struggles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so lots of, uh, uh, you get put through the test, right? And mm-hmm. they say actually enlisted military positions, one of the most stressful jobs in the, <laughs> in the world, right? <laughs> of, all the, of all the jobs. Uh, so when, uh, when you have those times of stress, what, what kinds of things have you guys done to, um, to cope with stress, to, to manage some of that, to get back to your sense of purpose? Um, I talk to my family. I probably talk to my family every day, if not every other day. Um, it feels nice talking to them and talking about like home and everything and how things are going back there. So it really like calms me down to talk to them. Or I've even started like a bunch of new hobbies like painting or knitting and stuff like that just like random things just to kind of get my mind off of everyday life and just kind of relax and be in one spot at a time and not think about like what am I going to do tomorrow kind of thing yeah so some some of it's reaching out for help and Mm -hmm. and just that opportunity to vent and de-stress right Mm -hmm. some of it's also it sounds like knitting can be both creative but also distracting yeah right yeah when I was, uh, way back when, when I was in grad school, I worked in a residential substance use facility. Mm-hmm. And so these are, uh, it was uh, all women in the facility, but these are people that are struggling with really significant traumas a lot of times and addiction. And the one thing that they found solace in was they would do group treatment, but they would uh, do crochet or knitting mm-hmm. during treatment because it kept their mind just distracted enough so that it didn't feel overwhelming. So that's, yeah. a, that's a great strategy. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I would agree. Um, I like to draw, so me getting back into my art, doing that helps. Uh, me talking to my, sp- uh, my spouse and falling back on religion helps me keep my mind straight and stuff. Yeah. So kind of getting at those, uh, all those different areas. Uh, have, you, um, have you ever found something that uh, other people don't typically do as a coping strategy? Something that's, uh, you know, not the stereotypical things that you hear about? but that works for you or works for somebody else? Mm, honestly, I, ha- I haven't really. Probably a good thing to ask to see different points of views. Yeah. Um, something I like to do is just like find random recipes online. And I don't know, I'm a big foodie. So whenever <laughs> I find like a good recipe and I get very happy whenever I eat food. Yeah. <laughs> so like I'll find like a good recipe and it's like, oh, this is fun. I get to try something new. So that's also like another de-stressor that I do. I like to cook and bake and everything like that. Yeah. We, uh, in uh, mental health, we talk about love languages, right? Mm-hmm. And I always joke that food is my love language. Yeah, cause... that's how I feel. <laughs> food is my love language. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I gave my example of collecting moving boxes. Um, I, uh, as, as silly as this sounds, um, my nightly routine is watching crime shows. Mm-hmm. So I really <laughs> enjoy murder shows Yeah. Uh, because after a long, stressful day, uh, just watching violence sometimes is <laughs> <laughs> feeling. 
decompressor. <laughs> That's secret, right? Uh, awesome. So, uh, yeah, you said you've been in it's twenty years, right? Yes, ma'am. That's a long time. And mm -hmm. uh, so, over the over the course of a couple decades now, um, what kinds of support resources have you seen? Uh, what kinds of uh, support resources have you utilized, or or things that you've seen successful for others? Uh, the thing that I've seen successful for others is definitely um, like MFLAC, uh, the chaplain, and um, honestly, the first sergeant. A lot of people attend and lean on their first sergeant, which they normally have a lot of information. Um, and for that person, if they're spiritual, whatever their spirituality is, they lean on that. I've seen it's been super helpful. And um, this family and friends support, support from family and friends is, is a real good thing. I think MFLAC is a really good resource. I know I've used MFLAC a few times um, when I've gone through some like family issues. I I had one in my squadron when I was in maintenance and I would go to her and just talk to her. And even if it was just about something small, I would just sit there and kind of just vent. And that's just really nice to have that now because in most of the squadrons on the base, you have an MFLAC. And I think that's super, super helpful to have. Um, because I know some people get like in their head about like mental health. Like if you go to mental health, then it's gonna be terrible for your career. And just having that in your squadron is super helpful. And like I said earlier, my family, like I just vent to them about everything. Like they know when I've had a crazy day at work or if something's going on in my relationship, like they know. And I think having those support systems and uh, helping agencies is super helpful to have in the military because people are stressed all the time. Yeah, there's um, there's so many good resources. It's just getting past that stigma, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I always uh, I'm I'm gonna um, put my plug in right for mental health, <laughs> right? That 97% of people that come into mental health don't have negative career impact. Um, but uh, I also think it's important for uh, people in leadership positions, right? So you'll be moving into a leadership position one day, you're in a leadership position, uh, I'm in a leadership position. And so it's important for our, our leaders also to talk about mental health. So yes. um, mm -hmm. we had our uh, squadron suicide prevention training the other day. And uh, you know, one of the things that I mentioned was it's uh, as we get uh, as we grow up in rank. Uh, it's also important to uh, to talk out loud about the experiences we have, and and so one of the things I mentioned there was, you know, I'm a major, I'm a clinical psychologist, I love therapy, not only doing it but attending it, <laughs> uh, and so you know, in my in my personal experience, I have been to therapy, I have um, I have used military one source several times. Uh, I've used uh, regular therapy, and and it truly is life saving. And so to be able to say that as a as a major, as a you know somebody uh, over a flight, but to say that that like it helped me, and it's mm -hmm. real, and it's important, mm -hmm. and your mental health is vital. I think is really important. I, I I saw a statistic the other day they just published that said something like I can't remember if it was thirteen or sixteen percent of O sixes are currently in mental health treatment. And that's a big mm. deal. That's a mm -hmm. that's a, a fairly decent number of individuals um, at higher levels because it, it shows our job is stressful. We mm -hmm. have a lot going on. And if your leg was broken, you'd go see a doctor. So if you got stuff going on mentally, you also you also see somebody. Mm. I think it's just like a stigma that if you go to mental health, you're, you're crazy versus just saying like, hey, you're just decompressing. You have issues going on. Let's talk to a professional to help you decompress and figure things out that's going on with you. I know several NCOs that went to mental health and their spines just really going there to talk about stress and just help them figure things out. So it's definitely a good source. Yeah. Yeah, I think the stigma about going to seeing like a therapist or anybody to talk about your issues is definitely higher in the military than in the civilian world because I have best friends back home and they tell me that they go and see their therapist like once or twice a week but like in the military a lot of people don't talk about that and it's just very different about how open people are in the civilian world about going and seeing somebody about getting help and all that then in the military everybody's scared to talk about it people are scared to say oh yeah i'm going to see mental health today and i think that it would be a lot healthier if we were 
in that aspect more like civilians and we're able to be comfortable about that. Yeah, there's there's so many people nowadays. I see uh, I've gotten to the point where there's now a generation younger than me that's in the military, which makes me feel very old. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the current youngest generation in the military is so much more comfortable with this mm-hmm. than anything. And you've probably experienced that, too, yes. where people are much more willing to be open to talk about, you know, hey, I need help and, and I'm not ashamed of that and I'm OK with that. And so now it's it's kind of up to the leadership, too, to say, you know what? You're right. Mm-hmm. We we shouldn't be hiding in the shadows. I, I'm not perfect. I don't know if you guys are, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not perfect, and I don't. I really don't think anybody is. And I think everybody uh, out there has had at least one bad day, mm-hmm. and and sometimes bad weeks, bad months, right? I think, yeah. right. <laughs> I think the old school heads think of it as military health the way it is because of um, they look at the military as being strong. Like I'm a soldier. I'm supposed to be strong. So you. You hold in everything in, and all it does is make things worse. Yeah. yeah, you have to have those like military bearings and everything. Yeah, not supposed to show emotions mm-hmm. and all that, and um, especially during uh, like I was deployed for six months, and I'd only been in the Air Force for eight months probably when I left. Like uh-huh. I hadn't even hit a year yet, so that was definitely like a hard time. But um, we had a lot of like we had those helping agencies over there and a lot of friends and you become like a family over there and you talk about all your issues and I know we would just sit there and get all of our feelings out at one time like we'd have our little mini therapy sessions with our friends and that's definitely important but yeah I think people just need to be more comfortable with talking to their friends and and stop feeling like that we have to have this because military bearing, like, it's good to have, but, like, you have to be able to break down those walls and talk about how you're actually feeling. Yeah, we're all human, right? Yeah. Or, <laughs> as far as I know, yeah. we're all human. Yeah. At the end of the day, we all have a variety of emotions, and, mm-hmm. and that's normal. Yeah. You're right. I think it's something in the military that makes us feel like we have to uh, operate almost on a limited limited scale of emotions. Mm-hmm. Um what do you think we can do to fix that? I think just uh, having a conversation, keep having a conversation. Um, as long as I think uh, leadership stop going into the old ways of shut up and color and stuff like that and be more understanding of things that's going on. Our environment is constantly changing and we have to adapt to it ourselves. Yeah. Um, my big thing that I do is like whenever I ask somebody like, how's your day going? And they say, oh, it's good. I'm like, like is it like is it really going good (laughs) like is there anything you need to talk about like I have um whenever I did work with other people in my office um like every morning I'd be like how is your day going like how was your weekend did you do anything like kind of get more involved with like what's going on in your coworkers' lives instead of like the basic like oh I'm good that's good (laughs) have a good day like you want (laughs) to like kind of know what's going on what's going on in their personal lives and if they're doing okay so that way you can kind of tell if somebody's not feeling well when they're in the office because um I know with my coworkers, like I can definitely tell if something's wrong and they need to talk and like I try and be that person but I know sometimes people just don't want to talk about it yeah it's that it's that idea of intrusive leadership right that mm-hmm. I am so present in somebody's life that you know I know what's I know their their family. I know their Mm -hmm. personal situation. We've talked about different stressors, financial stressors, moving stressors, job stressors, deployment stressors, all the Mm -hmm. different things that go on. But if you if you get to know the people around you, then you can build those relationships. Uh, And then when they do have an off day, it's not just a random person that's showing up next to you in the work environment. You know them, you know that they're off, you know that something's going on. And then you've built the relationship enough so that you care. Mm-hmm. Right, you care that something's going on and you want to help them. I've definitely seen that. Um, we had an airman that like I knew how he was and everything, and just observing. And one day he just looked like something was going on. Just and then me, I am just coming through, just like you said, asking, "Hey, how you doing? What's going on?" And I could just see it in the face. I knew something was wrong with him, and we just sat there and talked pretty much honestly for like two hours, walking across the flight line, and find out that he was honestly going through separation anxiety with his family because him joining the military, his family 
was more traditional. They just didn't accept it. And so because he joined, they kind of didn't want nothing to do with him. So it was pretty hard and just trying to give him some good advice and trying to help him out in the situation. And luckily things did change for him. He got better, so very, very good to see. It's it's hard to uh, it's hard to make assumptions about, or it may be easy to make assumptions, but it's hard to actually know what's really going on with the person unless you take the time to invest in them. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I've uh, I uh, my dad was in the Air Force for thirty three years, and uh, um, he said actually it was uh, he was here at Barksdale. This was decades ago, uh, and he asked um, he asked the Eighth Air Force commander at the time. He said, "What was?" What was most surprising to you um, when you first became a squadron commander? What was the thing that surprised you most about that? And the answer he got, I kind of paused for a second, and the 8th Air Force commander at the time said, I was surprised at the amount of personal problems that people have. Mm -hmm. And what, what he meant by that was that, you know, you think that you're going into a leadership position and that your focus is on, you know, taking care of the mission, getting things done, achieving all this stuff, but the mission doesn't happen without the people. And so uh, when you really get to know people, I mean, I can think about my past week and all the things that I've been dealing with over the past week. Mm -hmm. And I think each person can think about that and then you multiply it, you know, times an element, times a flight, times a squadron. And the, the personal things that people are dealing with, uh, you may never even realize the stuff that people have going on uh, in, unless you take that time to invest. So uh, it, it's not to be understated taking care of ourselves and each other. Mm. True. Yeah. With the, like the separation anxiety, I've known a few people that have, the, like, they're the first generation in the military, their families grown up in this town their entire lives, and they're the first family member to ever leave so I know that that can be really hard for a lot of people um like me being an air force brat I never really thought about that like to me that's weird <laughs> it's like oh you grew up in one spot your whole life that's just like crazy to, for me to think and then like I kind of had to like put myself in there she's like yeah no I'm sure it is very hard for them having to leave their whole family that's spent generations in one city and I know that they struggle with that a lot and that's very, like, I'm sure that's very hard for them to go through. I think that's probably <laughs> most of the things that I've seen with the younger generation is that a lot of them are on that same level. It's just a, a separation problem of going from civilian life to military lifestyle and being completely separated from their family and friends and trying to get that, that understanding. It's pretty hard for a lot of them there. Mm -hmm. It seems like that also is a reason to emphasize that importance of our military community, right? So like mm -hmm. uh, wrapping ourselves around people and protecting them uh, because they may come from a place where they have left everything they know and come into a new environment. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they're learning to live on their own. They're learning to live without these people that they've always been around. They're uh, establishing new friendships and trying to learn a, a new job and, you know, taking care of paying bills and all the other stuff that comes with that uh, initial first assignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know for like airmen in the dorms, they struggle a lot, especially like around the holidays and everything. And because some people can't afford to go home on Christmas and Thanksgiving and everything. So I know lately, like they've been trying to do a lot more or like with COVID and everything, trying to do more events for the airmen in the dorms. And I think that that's really a great idea to get airmen out of the dorms because if all they're doing is going to work, going to the dorm and just sitting in their dorm every day, it takes a toll on you and you get very down very quickly doing that. So having those events is great for the airmen to get out and meet more people. Yeah, it, it gives us that sense of um, connection, right? Mm -hmm. So being connected to the people around us, connected to resources, connected to our community, right? We have mm -hmm. a, a local community as well. Um, I, I know since uh, since I've been here, uh, the uh, being able to go on some of the nature trails and seeing some of the things, but. Uh, so connecting me with the local environment. I've never mm -hmm. lived in this part of the country before. And so um, getting connected there, but also, uh, um, you know, making making connections with both the people that are supervised, but also the people that are on a, a peer level with me uh, is has been really important. You survive mm -hmm. that way, right? You survive with that human interaction. 
I feel like as leadership, it's our responsibility to have the airmen feel like they're part of the community, that they're actually a part of the, the unit. Um, and, you know, I was there before being airmen and stuff and coming in, you were literally separated from your family and then you have to deal with a whole new family. And so it can be very tough. So it was, you know, I, I talked to my other leaders and other NCOs and like, hey, you gotta make sure you're reaching out to your people and make them feel welcome because they're literally away from their family. Just like when you're, you send your children off to school, they're only with you maybe five hours a day after school. You know, you get home from work, it's dinner, maybe watch something on TV a little bit, take a shower, go to bed, and that's it. The education has more time with your children. So it's just like with the military, they're away from their family. We're with them pretty much eight, nine hours out of the day. So yeah, it's, it's a big responsibility to make them feel welcome to understand that like you are a family or your family away from your original family. Yeah. I feel like I've seen that done well in my career, and I've seen that done poorly oh, yeah. in my career. Right? <laughs> yeah, I was just yep. about to say, you want to make sure that it's, like, authentic, because I've had some people come up to me and, like, ask me, you know, it seems, like, forced that they're asking me how I'm doing, and I'm like, well, I don't really want to talk to you about anything because I don't feel comfortable. But if people are, like, authentic in the way that they say it and seem as though they actually do want to hear what's going on, then I feel that that's an easier way for you to open up and talk about what's actually happening. Yeah, it's that it's like that idea of um, like you can read a book on how to play play football, right? Mm -hmm. But you without actually going and doing it, you you're not going to be successful. So like you can read a book on leadership, mm -hmm. but until you actually put those things into practice when you do it, uh, you know, you do it for real, um, it's not quite the same. Yeah. And, and so if you just kind of surface level cover stuff, um, you're not really going to get to the real uh, um, connection that you have with people. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, an NCOA where they said, um, you know, just because you make rank, uh, you make an NCO rank or whatever, that you're put in a leadership position doesn't necessarily mean you're a leader. It's the airmen, the people up under you that you inspire that give you that title of you being a leader. So I think the misconception is that oh, I'm a staff sergeant, I'm a tech sergeant, I'm a leader. You're in the leadership role, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're a leader. So I tell my people all the time, like, I'm actually here to manage your time <laughs> with the work and, and manage your, your home lifestyle a little bit and stuff like that. Um, now, if I inspire you to do more than that, then I'm actually probably really fulfilling a leadership role more than others. So it's, it's tough on both spectrums. Yeah. So one of the... Uh the current Air Force Suicide Prevention Program, right, has uh, um, 13 different um, elements that make it, or 11, rather, 11 elements that make it successful. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the big elements is leadership, right? So we think about suicide prevention, we think, okay, maybe it's just training, which is a very small portion, that suicide tr prevention training, very small. Um, but the leadership component is huge, and that's one of the things that they found to be effective in preventing suicides is that leadership connection. So uh, September, Suicide Prevention yeah. Month, right? Uh, doing a lot of things to really highlight the importance of preventing suicides within our force. That's probably the one of the worst things that could happen, uh, both mm -hmm. to a family, to an individual, to a unit. Um, uh, the role of leadership is important in that. And then uh, at Barksdale, we're doing lots of things related to suicide prevention. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Um, well, currently I'm doing the, or with working with the BCAT, doing the suicide prevention new matter patch across the base. And um, this is the second year of doing that stateside. I worked with the chaplains while I was deployed and that's where the first you matter patch happened which I mean over there it's a lot easier we would just wear them every Friday and last year I got the idea I was like well there's a suicide awareness month and a suicide prevention month um I, I think we should do something about that stateside and I mean as a I was only I was an A1C then so I was like oh I'll just do it for a week <laughs> I don't even know if this is going to get approved I was like <laughs> I was super nervous about it and then I got approved and it was a huge hit. Like I bought 500 patches originally and we sold out within five days. Nice. And that's awesome. just having that support around the base and just seeing the um, you matter everywhere across the base. And if 
saying you matter across the base just one time saved one person, then that's what the whole project's about. And that's what everything that all the work that was for the patch, it makes it worth it. Yeah, it's, it's, I got mine. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, the, what's, what I think is so cool about this is that this is an airman, right? You're, you have an airman that sees a problem mm -hmm. and says, I'm going to do something about it. Uh, and you, uh, you didn't let any of the obstacles get in your way. You said, this is an important thing. I care about the people around me. I want to, I want to make sure this is a visible thing. Uh, it sends support, right? It's got a mm -hmm. phone number for the suicide prevention hotline, uh, on it. Like it's such good information to push out there. Uh, and, and for you to say, I want to do this and I'm going to make it happen, mm -hmm. um, is so cool. Like this is, it's, it's incredible to see that. So I, I'm, I'm proud to support you on it. Um, uh, and I'm just so impressed that you were able to do it and really that the, right. This is every, every day for the month of September, yeah. you can wear the patch, right? Yeah. So, uh, to also get the support from base leadership to, to say, Hey, this is such an important message that we're going to, going to support it and push it, uh, well, hundred percent. So, um, it's, it's just awesome. Such a cool thing. Thank you. <laughs> this is my first year on the committee. Um, I was presented an opportunity um, from another NCL, and I was said, "Hey, I would love to help out." Um, because I dealt with airmen that had suicidal thoughts, and the part that I'm playing is um, helping out with laps for life. And what that is is you will complete at least uh, 22 laps or walk around the track for 22 minutes. Um, in support of suicide um, prevention to give about the awareness. And the 22 comes from um, the suicide rate in 2000, I think it was 13, was 22 veterans a day. Um, since then, I think the last report 2020 was 17.8 suicides per day. So it has went down. And so the event is just to show awareness that, you know, that you actually do matter. And so the information that's on the patch, we actually made a shirt and it's actually on the back of the shirt. So it has a life for lap, lap I'm sorry, <laughs> last for life shirt. And then on the back side of it is all the information on the patch that they created. It was pretty awesome. So that's awesome. And that's the 17th of September, right? Yeah. 17 September starts at 0750 with the opening comments from the commander. Awesome. So some uh, big events to send the message. What, uh, so I, I can give a little bit about my, uh, personal uh, interest I um, in terms of suicide prevention. So mm -hmm. my I lost a cousin to suicide when I was uh, in eighth grade. And then I lost a, a aunt to suicide when I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. um, and so and then I've had uh, lots of family members who have experienced suicidal ideation, needed mental health treatment. Um, and then on a less serious note, I also grew up in the nineties. So I was fascinated by Frazier and Fox Mulder <laughs> and convinced I needed to be a psychologist based on nineties TV, um, made that decision when I was 14 and never gave it up. Um, but in terms of suicide prevention, I think when it, when it touches your life in that way, um, when you've, when you've lost somebody to suicide, when you've felt the impact when you've talked to people who have been suicidal, it puts it into perspective in a way that is uh, not just a CBT, not just an in-person training, not just, uh, you know, words on a paper. It makes it personal. It's you have, you have uh, been impacted by an individual who is in such a dark place and feels very isolated and so desperately needs help. And if you're able to uh, send a message to pull them out of that, to help them get the resources, um, you you can truly save somebody's life, save their well-being. It's it's uh, it's incredible the things that we can do to help uh, the people around us. And and when we see that, um, when we see that sense, right, going back to that sense of purpose, when we when we get the idea of this is what's important to us, these are the people that matter to us, and we can do something to take care of them. Uh, for me, that's that's one of the best things you could do, right? If you end your day and you say, I've helped somebody today, uh, that's that's an incredible thing. It is. Um, I know about several people that wanted to commit suicide, and there's one person that actually took their own life, and I didn't find out about it until this year. Well, actually, last year, sorry being stationed here as uh, one of our AFE members that was stationed with at the base. 
I'm old school military, so I feel like anybody I see in the uniform is my brother or sister. Like, at the end of the day, like, if they need me, I got them. I only have to know them. That's just how I was raised in the military. So to hear about that, it just, it just hurts. It hurts bad to see that one of your members took their life, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I've known a few people in my life that have uh, taken their own lives, and I've known countless people that have talked about their mental health issues and suicidal thoughts, and I think it's just very important to get knowledge out there for people. I mean, suicide is something that impacts almost everybody, and if they haven't had like a family member, or, like a loved one, take their own lives, they're extremely lucky just because how often it happens nowadays. And it's just, I mean, from, I think it said, like the statistic was from 18 to early 30s, suicide is like the number two cause of death. And it's just, that, that's just crazy to me because that's the main um, age group for people in the Air Force. So it's just important to get knowledge out there and to let people know that they have people have su have support. So so that even if it's not, if, even if they don't go for you know more formalized support, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's there's people out there for them, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's somebody wearing a patch saying, "Hey, I'm here for you," whether it's that uh, supervisor that's uh, willing to get involved with them to. Um, get to know them, to take care of them, to, you know, put, put a pause on the day and say, hey, we're going to talk, we're going to walk outside the building, we're going to walk on the flight line, we're going to do something um, because I care about you and you're important and I don't want you to get to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do get to that point, that's also okay because maybe I've been there before or somebody else has been there before. I know the resources, I know where to take you and we got you, right? Yeah. One thing that goes to what I was thinking on, um, a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, sometimes it's like, you know, we talk about the signs and stuff like that. And then when we hear about the people that took their lives and we go back, sometimes it's not signs. And so when I look at the patch that was made and it says you matter, it's, I think about more like the individual has to understand they matter to themselves. Like you have to love yourself. Like we're all gonna go through hardships and problems. That's just life. But the beauty is is learning from it that there's always going to be another day and so but just that simple phrase you matter i just take all that in and i hope that people see that and take that in too and one of, one of my favorite um quotes is uh in life pain is is uh um pain uh see now i'm gonna mess it up <laughs> <laughs> Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional, right? So uh, nobody is entitled to a stress-free life. Nobody is entitled to a completely mm -hmm. happy uh, life. We're all going to experience challenges, but what we do with those challenges is what's going to make the difference. Yes. Yeah, people just need to, um, for anybody that's like struggling with their mental health or suicidal thoughts or anything, they just need to know that they're never alone. Like, even if it's not a family member or friend, just somebody... Um, like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, they can call that at any time and like talk about how they're feeling. And just so that just, it's important to let people know that there is always an option for some somebody they can talk to or a place that they can go, that they're never alone. There's always someone or somewhere. Yeah, the, the um, suicide prevention, uh, hotline, right? 1-800-273-TALK. Um, it, uh, uh, I had a patient uh, years ago who had PTSD. They mm -hmm. actually weren't suicidal, but they were really struggling and they, uh, they were hesitant to talk to their wife about what they'd experienced. It was uh, combat related trauma. Um, they didn't want to expose their wife to all the honestly horrors that they had experienced. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they wanted to talk about it and it was like the middle of the night and they didn't know what to do. And so they called the hotline and they're like, I'm not suicidal. I just need to get this out. And, uh, um, the individual told me, they're like, I talked to this person on that hotline for an hour 
And it was one of the most helpful things because it was somebody that was there, that there was no ramifications. I could talk, I could, you know, get what I needed out and they were supportive. And it allowed me to feel a little bit of that sense of catharsis afterwards. Like, okay, now I feel, I feel like I've expressed what I've been holding in. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's one of the, um, great things about the patch is that all the proceeds are being donated to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline to help set up those call centers, those help centers, so that people are able to always have somebody to talk to and always have somebody, some place to go to, because sometimes people need that like in-person interaction and they can go in and talk to somebody. Um, for some people, it's as simple as a phone call and that one phone call can change everything. Yeah, and you can text too. Mm -hmm. I learned that you can text yeah. on that, <laughs> yeah. which is awesome. Yeah. And they even have like, there's random apps that are like texting therapy and stuff so that you can talk to somebody like that if you didn't want to go through the lifeline. Like there's so many options out there. And I think that it's, we just need to spread more of that information so that people are aware of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, are there, uh, do, hmm. Are there other ways that we can get the message out? Are there other things that we could be doing? Um, I think that it's important um, to raise awareness throughout the entire year. And because I know right now everybody's sending out like the numbers and I know the patch is only for September, um, but suicide awareness is every day. Like it shouldn't be just a once a year kind of thing. It should be talked about not just at the trainings once a year it should be talked about all the time um safety briefings should mention it more and i think that just having those signs around the base that say where the helping agencies are and having those little pamphlets and everything it just should be talked about more throughout the year instead of just once a year mm -hmm. Took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. I agree. I was thinking like it should be honestly like all through the year and not just section off to a month thing. Um, as far as in, in my realm and leadership, um, just with our flights, doing more things with our flights, reaching out, doing things other than work, getting back to really making a unit a family. I think stuff like that really helps out. Mm -hmm. So again, that connection, right? So we talked about leadership, we talked about connection, we talked about finding a purpose, um, and all of these things contribute to making sure that we're taking care of our biggest resource, our most important resource, which is our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So uh, we've talked about a lot of things today, um, and it's, it's awesome to get the perspective from both of you guys, having just a wide variety of Air Force experience, different AFSCs, different sections, mm -hmm. Um, obviously, I, I will always be on my soapbox as a mental health provider <laughs> promoting mental health, but I think uh, the work that you guys are doing is actually uh, in some ways a lot more important because uh, right, I have a vested interest in, in promoting my career field, mm -hmm. uh, but you guys are promoting your people. Um, you're, you're establishing the importance of taking care of others, of leadership, of purpose, and so um, I just want to say thank you both for being here today. Thank you for all your efforts in terms of suicide prevention. Um, please continue to spread the word. Um, I am always available for anybody that ever wants a hypothetical question because <laughs> at the end of the day, my goal is to make sure that people are taken care of. And so it sounds like you guys are, are on that same page too. Yes, ma'am. So awesome. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us.